Another dark, dark case here. And Rakita, the Vampire of Barcelona, Marty. Estimated body count? At least 12. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, when wealthy Barcelona residents wanted help with love or a cure for TB or syphilis, they visited Enriquita Marti, who sold expensive curatives. Meanwhile, Marti lured children to her home. Before killing them, she used the rendered fat bones, skin, muscles, and hair in her elixirs. Marti often prostituted the children capture. In March 1912, two young girls, Angelita and Teresita, escaped from Marty's flat and told the police they witnessed Marty butchering a young boy. Police searched Marty's properties and found body parts, jars of blood fat, and recipe books written in Marty's hand specifying the horrific ingredients used in her portions. Punishment. Marty's cellmates killed her before she went to trial. I don't know if anybody has a problem with that. I mean, this is insane. Another more detailed write up here from Wiki. Born 1868, died May 12, 1913. A Spanish child serial killer, kidnapper, prostitute, and procuress of children. She was called the Vampire of Carrer Ponent, the Vampire of Barcelona, the Vampire of the Raval in the press. Some researchers have, however, asserted that she was not a killer of children, but rather a person with mental disorders who can only be proven reliably to have abducted one young girl, Teresita Guitar. They also contend that the black legend that is attributed to her could not be demonstrated. Early Life and Riquita Marti was born in saint Falou de la Brugat in 1868. As a young woman, Marti moved from her hometown to Barcelona, where she worked as a maid servant and a nanny. She soon turned to prostitution and worked in a high-class brothel. In 1895, she married a painter named Juan Puyallo, but the marriage failed. According to Puyallo, Marti's affairs with other men, her unpredictable character, and her continuous visits to houses of ill repute caused the separation. The pair reconciled and separated approximately six times. At the time of Marty's detention in 1912, the couple had been separated for five years and had no children. Black Legend. In 1909, Marty opened her own brothel, which attracted some of the more affluent in Barcelona. Some of them had unusual desires, which she accommodated for a premium. Some expressed a desire for children. To accommodate them, she dressed as a pauper during the day and frequented the poorer parts of the city. When she came across unaccompanied children, she abducted them to prostitute them in her brothel. Was she the original Jill Zane Maxwell? She begged and joined bread queues at the monasteries to find the most abandoned-looking children. By night, she attended the El Lesu, the Casina de la... Arabaceta and other places where the wealthy of Barcelona gathered, likely offering her services as a procurer of children. Wow. So this is like, wow. I mean, this is so dark. This is like the, the Maxwell Epstein ring over a century earlier. At the same time she was prostituting children, she was also practicing as a witch doctor. She claimed drinking the blood of children could cure tuberculosis. Uh-oh, again, is this some kind of adrenochrome a century before? And offered creams and elixirs that could stop aging and prolong life. The ingredients she used to make her remedies came from the remains of the children that she was killing, who ranged from 5 to 15. She used the fat, blood, hair, and bones. For some reason, she did not have problems disposing of her victims. Marti offered salves, ointments, filters, poultices, and potions, especially to treat tuberculosis, which was highly feared at the time, and various other incurable diseases. The wealthy paid large sums of money for these remedies. During the tragic week of 1909, she was arrested at her flat on Barcelona's Car Minerva, along with a young man from a wealthy family, and accused of running a brothel that offered sexual services from children. Thanks to her contacts with Barcelona's high society using her services, she was never tried. 
again, echoes of the Jill Zane, Maxwell, Jeffrey Epstein rings. I mean, this is crazy. Over the next three years, many more children disappeared, but as they were from poor families, police investigations into their disappearances were minimal. Crazy. Also shades of a lot there. It is suspected that she kidnapped a large number of children over a span of 20 years. She was finally arrested in a flat in El Raval. More evidence was found in flats in Barcelona, where she had lived previously. So she just left evidence everywhere. Forensic experts managed to differentiate a total of 12 children with what little evidence they were able to recover. In spite of suspicions, and because Marty did not tally her activities, experts are unsure if she was Spain's deadliest killer. It is clear that she acted for many years in Barcelona. The public suspected that someone was kidnapping babies and many children disappeared without a trace, causing dread among the population. 29. Carrer Ponent On February 10, 1912, she kidnapped her last victim, Teresita Gutart Congost. For two weeks, the city looked for her, and there was great public indignation since the authorities had been extremely passive regarding the missing children. As suspicious neighbor Claudia Elias found Cognost's trail, on February 17th, Elias saw a girl with cropped hair looking from a casement window of a first floor flat at number 29, Carrer Ponent, now Carrer de Joaquin Costa. Elias had never seen the girl. She asked her neighbor if the girl was hers, but the neighbor, who was Marty, closed the window without saying a word. Elias shared this, as well as her suspicions that the little girl was congost, with a mattress marker down the street. She also told him of the strange life that her neighbor was leading. The mattress maker informed a municipal agent, Jose Ascens, of Elias' suspicions, and he, in turn, communicated this to the chief of the Ryboat Brigade. On February 27th, wow, it took that long, saying there had been a complaint about chickens in the flat, two Ryboat agents went to look for Marty. They found her in the court of Cal de Ferlandina, informed her of ac the accusation, then escorted her to her flat. She proved to be surprised but did not object. When the policemen entered, two girls were found in the flat. One of them was Teresita Guitard Congost, the other a girl named Angelita. After making a statement, Congost was returned to her parents. She explained how Marty took her by the hand, promising her candies, covered her with a black rag, and forced her to the flat. Marty cut Congost's hair and changed her name to Felicidad telling the child she no longer had parents and was to call her mama from then on. I mean, this is so dark. Marty fed the girl potatoes and stale bread and preferred to pinch rather than beat the child. She was prohibited from going to the windows and balconies as well as several rooms in the flat. Congas told authorities that Marty was in the habit of leaving them alone and that one day they risked exploring the rooms that Marty forbade them from entering. They found a sack with girls' clothes covered in blood and a boning knife also covered in blood. Congost never left the flat during her captivity. And Jolita's declaration was more frightening. Before Congost arrived at the flat, there was a five-year-old boy named Pepito. And Jolita said that she secretly saw Marty, whom she, she was calling mom, kill him on the kitchen table. And Jolita's identity was more difficult to pinpoint as she did not know her real surname but confirmed Marty's claim that her father was called Juan. Marty maintained that Angelita was her daughter by her estranged husband, Juan Pujalo. He appeared before a judge and declared that he had not lived with Marty for years, that they had not had children, and that he did not know where Angelita came from. Eventually, Marty claimed that she had taken the girl as a newborn from her sister-in-law, having told her that the girl was stillborn. And Rakita Marti Rapoles was detained and jailed in Reina Amalia prison. During the second inspection of the flat, detectives found the sack with the bloody clothing and the knife. They also found another sack with dirty clothes and at least 30 small human bones. These bones shown evidence of it being exposed to fire. Investigators found a lounge sumptuously decorated with a cupboard with nice clothes for a boy and girl. This lounge contrasted with the rest of the flat, which was austere and smelled badly. In another locked room, they found the horror that Marty was hiding. In it, there were 50 pitchers, jars, and washbowls with preserved human remains. Greasy lard, coagulated blood, children's hair, skeletons of hands, powdered bones, 
and pots with potions, ointments, and salves already prepared for sale. Investigators also went to two more flats where Marty had lived, a flat in the Carrer Tollers, a third in Carrer Picolcus, and a little house in Carrer Jocks Florals in Sans. In both of them, they found false walls and human remains in the walls and ceilings. In the garden of the house on Carrer Jacques Florals, they found the skull of a three-year-old child and a series of bones that corresponded to three, six, and eight-year-old children. Some remains still had pieces of clothes which, whose condition indicated that Marty had habitually kidnapped children of impoverished families with insufficient means to look for their missing children. Further investigation revealed that the housing in saint felu de la Bargat, property of Marty's family, here they found remains of children in vases and jars, as well as books of remedies. In Marty's flat, they found curious things. An ancient book with parchment covers, a book of notes where she had written recipes and potions in elegant calligraphy, a package of letters and notes written in coded language, and a list with names of families and important figures in Barcelona. The list was very controversial since the public believed that it was a list of Enriquita's rich clients and that because of their wealth, they would not pay for their crimes of pedophilia or of buying human remains to treat their health. Police tried to stop the list from leaking, but rumors abound that it was a client list of doctors, politicians, businessmen, and bankers. So this was the original Epstein client list. With events of the tragic week in their mind and fearing riots, authorities calmed the public with newspaper articles explaining that the list contained the names of people that Marty had begged from and that they had been swindled by the lies and requests of the murderer. I'm sure everybody believed that. Marty was imprisoned in the Reina Amalia jail to await trial. She tried to commit suicide by slashing her wrists with a wooden knife. Public indignation exploded because the people wanted her to face trial and execution by Garrett. Prison authorities made it known in the press that measures had been taken to ensure that Marty would not be able to kill herself. Marty was never tried for her crimes. She died a year and three months after her arrest at the hands of her prison mates. Her companions killed her by lynching her on one of the prison patios May 12, 1913. Some believe the inmates were paid by Marty's wealthy clients, so the details of her crimes were not revealed in a public trial. However, her death certificate gave uterine cancer as the cause of her death. Yeah, that's definitely not a cover-up. The untimely death robbed authorities of the opportunity to completely expose all her secrets. She was buried secretly in a common grave in the Cementerio del Sudost, suited on the mountain of Montauk in Barcelona. Did Epstein kill himself? I mean, this is crazy. This is, wow. So this is the early 1900s, over a century before Epstein, and it's kind of the same events played out. I mean, history does repeat itself, doesn't it? Declarations and testimonies. Marty was interrogated about the presence of Teresita Gutart in her house and explained that she had found the girl lost in Hungary the day before in Ronda de Sant Pau. Claudia Elias denied this because she had seen the girl in her flat several days before the arrest. Marty was also questioned about the presence of bones, human remains, creams, potions, poultices, ointments, blood bottles, as well as the boning knife. Interrogators asked if she had subjected the bones to be burned or cooked, as forensics suggested. Marty claimed she had studied human anatomy, but under pressure from the interrogator, she confessed that she was a healer and used children as raw material for the production of her remedies. So she confessed to this. She claimed to be an expert and knew how to make the best remedies and preparations that were highly sought after by wealthy people of good social position. During interrogation, she disclosed the locations of her other flats, Carrer Tollers, Carrer Picalquez, Jacques Florals, and her home in saint Felu de la Brigat, and told investigators where to look inside them. She was already known for and confessed to for her service as a procurer for pedophiles, but out of anger at the fate that awaited her, she did not name a single customer. Investigators knew of the existence of the little boy known as Pepito from the testimony of Angelita and Claudia Elias. 
Marty claimed Pepito had been entrusted to her by a family that could not care for him. When asked for his whereabouts, she said that he had gone to the country because he had become ill, the same excuse she had used with her inquiring neighbor, Claudia Elias. Overwhelming evidence in Angelita's testimony shattered this excuse. She was unable to refute bloody clothes in a sack, the knife, and some remnants of fresh fat blood and bones. These remains were those of Pepito. Nor could she identify the family that had entrusted her with the child, making it clear that the boy was another kidnapped child. An Aragonese woman from Alcanese recognized her as the kidnapper of her infant son some six years earlier in 1906. Marty displayed an extraordinary kindness to the exhausted and hungry woman after a long journey from their land and was allowed to hold the child. Using an excuse, she moved away from the mother and then disappeared. The unfortunate mother never found her son, nor came to know what she did with him. It is suspected that she used the baby to manufacture her remedies. Marty confessed that she had prostituted a girl of 17 years in a brothel on Carrer Sabadell and had also performed abortions, but she never confessed to killing anyone. Counter theories. For his book, Barcelona 1912, Barcelona writer Jordi Corominas conducted an exhaustive investigation into the life of Enriqueta Marti. Reviewing the journalistic chronicles that were published at the time, he warned that many articles were based on the rough information that was available in the first days, but there was no subsequent investigative follow-up. In the opinion of Corominas, Marty was in fact a woman devastated by the death of a child barely 10 months old from malnutrition. In the words of Corominas, distressed by that situation, she kidnapped Teresita, maybe to find a company for Angelita, the other girl she cared for, in the flat she shared with her grandfather. She did not have an analytical or criminal mind. Well, how would he know? Today, she would have received psychiatric care. Again, how would he know? Is this uh, Jordi Corominas just a guy, you know, paid by for, you know, the families of the, these elites that were named in this list to do damage control? A hundred years later. The facet of Enriquita Marti as a serial killer would be, for Corminas, part of an unfounded black legend to cover cases of sexual scandals involving minors by the upper classes of society and the kidnapping of children for the cure of conditions afflicting the upper classes of the time. In his words, Enriquita was not a murderer, but rather a paradigm of a poor and desperate Barcelona that was not the one that used to go out in the media. Many of those who came back to explain the case just read the reviews of those first few days, but they stopped investigating the last traces of the story. In his book, Corominas explains that the remains of blood found in her house belonged to Enriquita, who suffered from cancer of the uterus that had caused her vaginal hemorrhages. On the other hand, well, what does that have to do with bones? On the other hand, the skeletal remains found were not shown to be of recently murdered children. According to Corminas, they were probably extracted from some cemetery. Well, how would he know? He's just assuming here they were probably? I mean, how would he know? He didn't examine them. They were probably extracted from some cemetery and used as magical amulets and others were animals used for cooking chicken and pork bones. He also considers that the existence of the ointments with which Enriquita sold as medicinal remedies were not proof. So this is just some random guy's hallucinations and opinions. Weird. Historian Elsa Plaza spent seven years studying the case of Enriquita Marty and has written a book, The Sky Underfoot, which brings to light information about the woman herself. Plaza explains that since 1912, Barcelona has referred to Marty as a serial killer, though Enriquita was never formally charged with murder, nor was any corpse of a child found in her home. Again, how does she know that? She often went begging with other women's children because there was a network of women who helped each other or because she's trying to get access to children. It was eventually shown that Angelita was truly her niece by her estranged husband, Maria Pujala. Marty's story had generally been told by men. Nobody thought that the blood found in her flat could belong to Marty herself. She was shown to be dying of uterine cancer and often bled heavily. Most newspapers at the time claimed Marty was the woman who had kidnapped about 40 children from the 5th District. Wait, they're saying this was somebody else? There was a she, there was a switched identity here? When the bones were found in one of Marty's houses in Carrera Pilla Curs, were determined to be from multiple animals instead of from children. 
the assembled journalist almost attacked the doctor who made the announcement. Well, here's the other thing, though. If these are elites with tons of money, they could have just paid the doctor to say that. I mean, this isn't rocket science. Again, I'm not claiming it's one way or another, but this is just kind of weird how these people can't even consider the possibility that these elites would do anything to keep their names from coming out. Marty's case was fodder for nascent tabloid journalism. She became the ideal scapegoat to blame for the missing children. Well, what if she was really responsible, though? And again, there could be other individuals who are also responsible. Again, what's with all these black and white logical fallacies? Shortly before Marty's arrest, police had closed a brothel in Carrera Botella that had prostituted children. The fine for raping a boy or girl was 50 pesetas. A worker earned four pesetas a day. The owner was apprehended, but not the customers. In addition, Barcelona was a major producer and exporter of pornography, exporting films and pictures to the rest of Europe and the Americas. Plaza explains that the entire trial was staged. They wanted to cover the misery and exploitation. The point of all was the discovery of a child brothel in Carrera Botella. It is true that children disappeared. Some were sent to France where they were exploited in glass factories outside Paris. She explains, the stolen or sold by their parents to ease economic hardship children were useful for begging, illegal adoptions, child abuse, or exploitation in factories where the hard work was crippling. We can suspect that some girls were victims of international trafficking for prostitution. Here, there are not many papers on the subject, but there are in Latin America. Girls were sent to New York, Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro. In 1903, the Board Against White Slavery was created and chaired by the Infanta Isabel. Plaza notes, when Enriquita Marti died at dawn, May 13, 1913, she was attended by two inmates who asked if they could attend to the body. So here's the thing. Again, these historians, unless they did in their book, and it was simply not outlined here, they just completely ignored all the testimony of witnesses. I mean, that's kind of weird. Smells like a cover-up.